Everybody, how's everybody doing? Yeah. Happy New Year. Yeah. 2016. What's up? That's crazy. That's crazy. My name is Pastor Derek, and uh, I just want to welcome you to Connect. Uh, our house is your house. If you're new to Connect, we welcome you. Hope you had a good experience so far. Everybody's starting the new year off right. I can tell. I can tell. You can get your worship guides out and you can follow along. We're starting a new series for the new year with a bang. Protect His House is about taking care of the temple of the Holy Spirit learning the importance and power of prayer. This will be a four-week series. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the protection of prayer. Next week, we'll talk about the, the, the pattern of prayer. And then I'm going to talk about powerful prayers in week three. And week four, I have no idea. So, <laughs> uh, just being honest. <laughs> I have some ideas, but I'm not sure. So, uh, we got a lot planned this year. It's going to be awesome. Um, I'm really excited about 2016, but uh, if you're just kind of connecting with us or you've only been here a little while, you're a frequent flyer, but maybe haven't been going, rolling with us a little while, we start the year off, as the Connect News was telling you, with a season of prayer and fasting. It's often looked at as an elite discipline, an elite spiritual discipline, but really in the scriptures, it's an elementary scriptural discipline. It's just, it's there for you. It's an opportunity for you. Uh, if you were listening to our church at home, did you guys enjoy church at home last week? Anybody? How many watched the message? Raise your hand if you watched the message. Good, good, good. Um, it just, you know, it, all the messages are online on our website at weconnect.cc, or you can go to Connect Community Church YouTube channel. All the messages are on there as well. Um, but I was talking about how important it is to fasting, prayer and fasting basically is an antidote for two big things. Disconnecting from the world, that's what fasting does, and prayer connects us more to God. And when those two things come hand in glove, we get stronger. And the spirit man, because we're triune, spirit, mind, and body, takes kind of uh, jurisdiction, or another simple way to say it is king of the hill. We used to play kill the kid when I was a kid, but it was just king of the hill, just a new version. <laughs> And so you just want to make sure that the, the flesh and the body are not leading, the mind is not leading, but the spirit is leading. So if you're setting goals for the new year, and I, and I suggest strongly that you do, um, better you, you, you set goals and only reach a few than set no goals and reach none, right? But if you're setting goals, which probably you are, a lot of times they have an external focus, relationships and finances and physical and all those kind of things because we spent too much money, we ate too much food, and we sat on our blessed assurance too long. And so as a result, it's, it's typically external. But I'm saying to you that if you're a Christ follower, you're in Christ, you will have more success if you establish a spiritual goal. It, all, your, all your goals are more likely to happen if you start from the inside out, not from the outside in. Can I have an amen? Amen. All right, turn to your neighbor and say, this is going to be good. <laughs> so we're starting prayer and fasting 21 days starting today, culminating on January 24th. We'll have prayer meetings right here in the auditorium. If you just want to get after it with us, 6.30 to 7.30, not 7.35, not 7.36. If you're talking to me, I'm out of here at 7.30, .30, I'm gone. Uh, we all have things to do, so it'll be one hour, and we're going to just do that for five days in the mornings, uh, Monday through Friday, and uh, we've got prayer guides. If you want those at Guest Central, you can go there. If you want to know about fasting, you don't know anything about it, like, what is he talking about? You can go to our website, and we have, like, a little drop menu and explain all the different types of fasting and scripture and styles and, you know, unplugging from this and unplugging from that, and all that stuff's on there, so you can check it out. Cool? Is everybody cool with that? Turn to your neighbor, say cool. The other one you didn't talk to before, say cool, cool, cool. Second choice. Your second choice. 
All right, so there's probably two key scriptures in the first part of your worship guide there. One's Matthew 26, 41, but I'm going to start at Matthew 6, 13. And I'm taking a verse from the Lord's Prayer, which is what it's called a lot of times. Sometimes it's called the model prayer, um, or it's a, but it's really a pattern of prayer, which we'll talk about next week. But there's one particular verse, and I think it really relates to the series on protect this house. The house that we're talking about is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that you are the temple of God? We don't, you know, it's, it's, we are the temple. So it's not, you know, it's not this building, it's you. When we assemble together, there's something significant and special that happens. But you are the temple of God, so we need to learn how to protect it against the attacks that come our way. So Jesus is talking to his disciples um, in Matthew chapter 6, and they're watching him, and, and they're seeing a difference in how he prays, and he basically he instructs them several things, and I won't go through the Lord's Prayer because it'll end up, I'll end up having to unpack it because of my disease to teach it all, but in verse 13, he basically says this. It says, and lead us not into temptation, or in one translation, it may say, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this is a prayer. Jesus is uh, leading them in this prayer, and it's kind of a template for prayer as well. But this particular line, do not lead us into temptation, or lead us not into temptation, messed me up for a lot of years as a Christian. I didn't understand it. It was a confusing phrase. Why would we ask God in prayer not to lead us into temptation when he's not going to do that? Why would God lead me into temptation? Like, why would he lead me into evil? That sort of thing. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? All right, so let's, let's, when you come to connect, we just kind of deal with stuff that, like, questions, and we're going to do a whole series after this called, you know, Q, like Q&A, or Frequently Asked Questions, and uh, we'll survey you pretty soon about that to see what you want to talk about, and we'll build a series around that, but, but I want to unpack this phrase, because it's misinterpreted, and it creates misinformation, and it creates misapplication as a result. We, we don't understand it, and sometimes we get in trouble because of it. So I'm going to give you four points. I'm not going to fill in the blanks right now, but here's kind of what the four points are. God can't do certain things, all right? That's one point. The other one is God won't do certain things because, because of his character, which we'll come back to. God will do certain things if I will do something. So that's what the message is. There's four things. I'm going to unpack those. And the motivation for the message is to help you in the new year and protect this house so that you get over some of the obstacles. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, there are these sins that so easily beset us. There's a picture kind of in the Hebrew. Hebrew sometimes uh, words have pictures to describe them. But sometimes the sins that the cords of sin and, and the entanglements of sin and the sins that so easily beset us sometimes are pictures. And it's like a, a dog that's biting at your heels. You just, uh, just get that thing off me. Have you ever been slowed down by something? Yes or no? Yes? Have you ever been slow? Like, I'm trying to make progress. I'm trying to get in stride. I'm trying to run faster, further, but I can't. Why? Because these sins get in my way, these, these, these chronicities, these iniquities, these patterns and things like that. And a lot of that is because we don't know how to overcome temptation. And so to get this house protected, we have to know how to be able to stand up against the different types of temptation we face. But in order to face those temptations, we have to understand uh, some things about temptation. So here's your big idea. Get protection and overcome temptation, all right? And we're going to talk about the direct association between prayer and protection. Can I have an amen? amen. So here's four principles on prayer, uh, excuse me, on temptation. Here's the first principle on it. Number one, write this down, God can't tempt anyone. So it's, it's important that you know this. God can't tempt anyone. Some people think things that are not necessarily accurate. Let me, let me give you an example. Some people think, this is a big word, but because of the sovereignty of God, he can do whatever he wants. Like, God can do whatever he wants. And he is large and in charge, don't misunderstand, but sovereignty refers to the fact that he is the supreme ruler over the universe. But how many know when you're in charge of something, you still have to be responsible? In fact, there's usually a direct association between your authority and your responsibility. You didn't get the authority if you weren't, in fact, responsible. And one of the responsibilities of God is to be a, a, a God of character. So God will never violate his character even though he's in charge. Does that make sense? Uh, my parents... Used to be in a dilemma when, when I have a younger sister, three years younger than me. My parents would go out to dinner and they would 
have a, have a, a problem with leaving me in charge. I couldn't wait. I'm like, ha, 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 I get to tell Janelle what to do, and you know what I mean? And I can just dominate, you know, that sort of thing. And they, I can see, like, you know, he's the elder brother. Anyway, so, but God's not like me, okay? So God is responsible, and he keeps, and he keeps within bounds within his character. So it doesn't take him outside of that. There's things, as a result, God can't do because of his sovereignty, because of the attributes of God. One of those is, it's a big word, and I promise I won't be here all day in big words, but the immutability of God, it basically is an attribute that, that says he can't change. God can't change. In other words, God can't get better because he's best. That's, I'm trying to make it simple, right? He can't get better because he's the best. He's perfect already. <clears throat> There's certain things God can't do. <clears throat> God can't lie. God can't, according to his word, this is awesome, ever stop loving you. He pursues you. He, he's not, he's not, he doesn't have to love you. He is love, according to 1 John chapter 4. So he can never stop doing that. He can't change. I am the Lord, I change not. It says in Malachi, he was, tells us he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. So he can't change. He can't stop loving you. He can't lie. There's certain things he can't do. And one of the things he can't do is he can't tempt anyone. He can't tempt anyone. So look in your notes. This is, uh, I don't know if this is in there, but this is a bonus scripture. James 1, 12 through 14. It says this. James 1, 12. It says, blessed is the man or woman. Ladies, you're not out on this. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So this is what they're saying. We are blessed when we endure temptation. Endure, it means, to re- it means to continue to trust God through resistance and opposition. Is everybody tracking with me out there? You are rewarded. You will be blessed. You will move forward. You will get your stride when you can endure temptation. I was talking about a scripture a couple of weeks ago from 1 Peter chapter 4, but it says basically at the end of the verse, Jesus suffered in the flesh just like us. Uh, like we do in our life now, but he suffered big time, way worse than us. And, he's, and it says, arm yourself with the same attitude that Jesus had, who suffered in the flesh and then was done away with or defeated sin. This is what that's saying. Jesus faced certain temptations, problems, trials, tests in his life, and there was a, there was a temporary suffering for this. Let me break this down for you. Do, you. do you know, like, this is an association that may, it's primitive, but it may help you remember this. Has anybody ever put Listerine in their mouth? Yeah. Right? Nobody likes it in there, right? But in order to kill the germs, you have to keep it in there a certain amount of time, or at least that's my understanding. I, if, you're, if you're a specialist in those kind of things, I don't know that's true, but that was always my, that's what my parents told me. <laughs> keep it in there and swoosh it around. There's a lot of bad stuff in there. So I always thought like germs and sin were like synonymous, you know what I'm saying? And so, and, and I can remember my dad be like, you got to go through the burn, you know? Once it's over, they're all dead. <laughs> and so I'd spit it out real fast and they'd be like, no, 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 no. You still got germs. You still got germs. There's a similarity to that when it comes to sin. There's a temporary suffering. You go through that burn for a little bit, but when you do, you, sin is done away with. You've defeated it. You move on to the next obstacle or next thing to face. Is anybody make, making sense of what I'm saying here? When you endure it, you are rewarded for it. So that's what this is saying here. Then it goes on. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, this is back to the main point, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. God can't be tempted by evil. Now, I'm going to explain a difference between God and Jesus in a little bit. Nor does he himself tempt anyone. So God doesn't tempt anyone, according to James 1.12. But each one is tempted when, you might want to circle like that, circle or underline that, circle line that. That's a good word. Put those two together. Circle line that. When he is drawn away by his own desires. When are we, when are we, when are we cross the line? When we're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. We're drawn away by our own desires, not by, what, not by what God does. God doesn't tempt anyone. He doesn't tempt anyone. So those desires that we're drawn away by are not always really bad ones. Sometimes the desires that draw us away are good things taken to extreme or excess. We, as Americans in particular, usually get ourselves in trouble not by 
traditionally, statistically, by the egregious, blatant sins, it's usually sometimes the good things that we've taken to the extreme or to the excess. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? So we're tempted when we're drawn away by our own excesses or extremes. That word drawn away, it means to turn aside. It means look another way. We've lost our focus. We've stopped seeing God and putting God in the first position in our lives. The Bible tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So our faith grows when we keep our eyes fixed on him. As soon as we change our focus, that's when the devil comes in, tempts us, and like pounces. Does that make sense? We're drawn away by our own desires. They're not always bad, but it's in that point that we're tempted and tests have to be passed in order to overcome them. And so this, this, you know what this is like. Guys, you know what it's like to be, I'm, I've been a gym rat since I was 15 years old, and, and I have to, uh, one of my friends, he might be here in this service, Brian and I were working out yesterday together, don't ever work out with Brian Bar- Barnes, he's brutal, and, and so I can barely walk. I almost came out here on a hoverboard just to be fun, but also so that I didn't have to walk, um, but uh, I um, was working out with him, and we were talking about how we're strategic about when we work out, because the dress code at the gyms has changed over the years since I was 15, you know? And so girls dress differently than they did back then. And so we're, we're, we want to be at less populated times. We, wanna, we don't want to be in all the riffraff and all the club in the gym and stuff like that. So we were just talking about that. But we're also talking about how you just kind of have to, it's okay to look, but it's not okay to linger. Does anybody, you know, you can admire God's beauty, but you can't lust after the beauty. So the linger is what gets you in trouble. It's the same thing. It could be a good thing. I was driving down Cedar Street just the other day. There's a beautiful house. It's covered in Christmas. I mean, when I say covered in Christmas lights, like this guy, wow, you need a life, pal. Uh, It's got a radio station you tune into when you drive by. But as I'm looking, though, if you look too long, you can have an accident, right? I mean, so anything that's good too far can become a bad thing. It's okay, Derek, to have a slice of raspberries and to mandanish. A slice is okay. (laughs) But but once you start it, the devil comes in and says, polish that baby off. (laughs) Go for it. You can handle it. You're a big guy. You know? You know this is true. But we lose our focus. Guys, you know, I think this is a generalization, but I think as guys, we like meat, right? Meat, you know? And girls like sweets, right, girls? You like sweets, right? I mean, so, okay, there's a few extremes. Whoever said that's like 49% male and uh, 51% female. <laughs> Don't get me interacting with the audience. This whole thing will get really crazy. Um, so, generally speaking, uh, we like, so, so what happens is that can be passed on to our kids. So, we start raising our kids. And it's funny, I was watching these parents try to uh, assuage and, and diffuse their, their upset child. The baby was crying, 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 crying. And, and the father was upset. And it was embarrassing. And the mother was upset. So, the grandparent got in there and said, give me the, give me the kid, give me the kid. And she couldn't get the kid to calm down. So then all of a sudden the grandparent sneaks out of the room with the kid, and I'm watching this whole thing, right? And all of a sudden just crying, going crazy, and then all of a sudden pull, whips out a piece of candy. Boom! Baby stops crying on a dime. <laughs> Magic. Why? Change of focus. Change of focus. Is everybody tracking with me? And that's when we begin to change our focus. In those situations, that's when Satan comes in. That's when the enemy comes in. He tempts us when we are drawn away by our own desires. Look in your notes, Matthew 4, this is what it says, supporting what we said so far. Now, when the tempter came to him, notice in the context, Jesus was fasting. So the tempter comes when you're getting ready to grow and move forward. Church, listen to me. It's the new year. You're establishing new goals. You want to be in church. You want to be getting in his word. You want to be growing. You want to deal with some things in your life. That's when the tempter is going to come. Because that's when he came to Jesus. And, and Jesus, is, if he wasn't off the hook, you won't be either on this. And it says, the Satan tempted him. If you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. So he will appeal to certain appetites. It could be good. Bread's not a bad thing. Okay, but sometimes it can be an obstacle in our lives if we take it too far. We take it at the wrong time. First Thessalonians 3, 5 says, For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent out to find out about your faith. Paul saying this, and I was afraid that in some way, 
the tempter had tempted you, and that our labors might have been in vain. So Satan comes in when we're trying to do something good, move forward, grow. Satan comes in and tries to manipulate circumstances, manipulate perceptions, manipulate good things, and get us to take good things to extremes or to excesses. Anything good taken too far can be bad for you. And that's why we need, as Christ followers, to exercise what Galatians says in chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Not the fruits, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit has nine expressions. One of those is self-control. If there's a fruit of the Spirit you should desire to apply to your life, in particular in a new year, in a new season, is self-control or temperance. And interestingly enough, if you look up temperance in a dictionary, it references more physical appetites like drinking and, and eating and things like that because, because God knows that a lot of times it's the external that's interrupting our spiritual connection with God. And that's why we fast to be able to put those, mortify the, the deeds of the flesh, crucify those sinful desires and those passions that take their extremes and take us over. A lot of times we can't connect with God, even pray, because our body is just ruling the roost. Does anybody know what I mean? Or is it just me? I guess it's just me. Nobody else knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I find that where I come into kind of friction in my own life and spiritual growth and things like that is it's not the... It's not so much the blatant things. I'm not saying that I'm not judging anybody else that has these that can have these issues, but but it, it's it's not like the extreme sins. It's usually the good things that keep me from the best things. Usually, like I have to be recalibrating my schedule and 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 managing my priorities to make sure that I'm not just prioritizing my schedule, but I'm scheduling my priorities. Because if there's something that gets me off track, especially when I'm trying to establish a godly trajectory for my life, it's when I remove myself from God for any length of time. As a result, now I'm disconnecting from my wife and not being at the same level of intimacy for her. Then it becomes my family. Then it becomes key relationships. Then it becomes passions and hobbies that are good and healthy for me and keep me where I need to be. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And before you know it, it's, it's because I'm out there saving the world trying to help everybody else in my own strength, in my own wisdom, in my own energy. And as a result, I can get in big time trouble. So you got to realize that sometimes the good is the enemy of the best in your life. And if you don't, you know, if you don't, if you don't pay attention to that, you can, be, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. I'm taking this just a step further. A lot of times, you know, we give up things thinking they're, they're good things. And so I'm going to sacrifice those, but end up, you end up, you end up um, exchanging those for sometimes negative things. In other words, we need to be doing things that bring life and joy and peace into our lives. There are certain passions and desires that God put there for you and for your benefit. Now, it could be different for you than me. You know, I, it could be walking and talking with, with a friend. You know, my mother used to take walks with friends for like 30 years every day. Kept her healthy, kept her mentally healthy, things like that. Could be exercise for you, should be, some level, uh, especially as we get older. It could be reading, it could be golf, it could be fishing. Those things, sometimes we pull those things out of our lives while we're trying, and we're not recreating or recreating ourselves in order to stay healthy. And as a result, when we pull those things out to sometimes do more good things, to get ahead, to, to, to you know, overcompensate for something that we're trying to fix, the enemy offers a counterfeit fun, a counterfeit passion, a counterfeit for those desires that you have in your life. And you may want to write this somewhere in the margins, but sin is simply a counterfeit joy. Sin is simply a counterfeit joy. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 that sin has pleasure for a season. It's fleeting. So if you are not intentional about putting things in your life that are bringing peace, joy, right standing, health to your life, then the enemy tempts you with counterfeits at the most inopportune time. And they, they do bring a level of pleasure, but only for a season, and then it takes more than it can give every single time. And that's how we get in trouble. Number two, so God won't tempt us. Number two, God won't mislead us. God can't tempt us, and God won't mislead us. So when we pray, God, lead us not into temptation, but now you're saying God won't mislead us. What does that mean? Well, we have to understand temptation. 
We have to understand the, ch the nuances and the, the actual translations of those particular words. And there are rules of biblical interpretation that sometimes help us understand the Bible. If you just, as you grow as a Christian, you have to understand some things. And I'll give you one simple principle at the end of this. But let me just say this. There are, you got to look at things in context. You got to you got to see the other usages of this word in scripture and and if you really want to go deeper there's other things you know just learning the original languages because words have more or broader meanings this word temptation lead us not into temptation has broader meaning and James 1 verse 2 and following let me read this to you it says this my brethren uh, church, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. You see that word trials. That word trials is the same word we see in Matthew 6, 13, temptation. Trials and temptations, same exact original word. In other words, count it joy when you face certain tests or trials in your life, knowing what? That the testing of your faith produces patience. God is a good God, and he will lead you into certain tests and trials. So would God ever lead you in trial or test? The answer is yes, according to James chapter 1. Because why? Because it develops you. It grows you. That's what James is telling you. So God knows the only way for you to grow, for you to get stronger, is to face certain tests. We know that in life. We know that from certain natural experiences. We know, you know, no pain, no gain. We know we believe in resistance training when we talk about exercise. It's the same truth when it comes to our spiritual life. Amen? So God wants you to be able, equipped, that when the tempter comes, you are prepared in prayer to face that. But in order to, to, to trust your faith, it has to be tested. No faith is trusted if it is never tested. If it's never tested. This is really good preaching. I just want to note that. And uh, there's a few people that agree. But anyway. So, so, so Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples in Matthew chapter 6 by what he said, but you have to understand the words that he's using have a deeper or broader meaning. Matthew 4, 1, he, we can clear this up even more. It says, then Jesus, this is an example with the Son of God, was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Did Satan lead him into the wilderness? No. God led Jesus into the wilderness. Why did he lead him there? To be tempted by the devil. So... God will lead us in order to test us, in order to develop us and grow us. God led his own son into a time of trial and testing, knowing that the tempter would be there. Why did he do that? He did it for the good of his son. How do you know that? Let me show you. Luke 4, 14 says this. Look in your notes. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region. In other words... After that testing period, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. After that, Jesus came back more powerful than before. Is everybody tracking with me on this? God knew that would happen. He knew the only way for that to happen was to have a certain test or trial or difficulty for us to pass. So he became stronger. Just so you know, Jesus is God incarnate, God in the flesh. So some of us dismiss what Jesus did here on earth he, because we think he did it in his divinity, but he did it in his humanity. He was just like us, the Bible says. He faced the trials and temptations that you and I face, and he had to rely on relationship. He had to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to overcome these temptations. And he showed us how to do it so that when we face it, we could do it too. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's what's going on there. So he did it for the good of his son so he'd be more powerful. Why does he do it for us? He does it for our own good as well. He does it for us. God will lead. In fact, one verse in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it says that God led his son. It's actually referring to Israel or his people. He led his son or his own people into a test not to fail but to su succeed so that his success would benefit and strengthen others. It says this in, in, in plenty of places. But what I love is that he shows us the benefits and he identifies with us as well. Hebrews 4.15, look in your notes. It says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot, we don't have a, a, a God we go to who put, makes uh, who intercedes for us to God the Father, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. No, he can sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points. Everybody remember this. 
all points, tempted as we are, and then the key last part we sometimes miss is, yet he was without sin. Here's another verse, Hebrews 2.18 says, For in that he himself, Jesus, has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Because he was tempted, he can help you and me when we're tempted. How many need to overcome a little bit of temptation in your life? Does anybody need help with that? I know I do. So do you know that Jesus can help you with your temptation? The answer is absolutely. Why? Because he went through it. And last night I was preparing and I got this little, you know, sometimes you just read the word, you get a little bit more, you get a little bit more. And it was just one of these things I was like, oh, God, that's so good. It was totally from him. I, I can't even tell you I did a lot of digging into this yet. But he, he, this is what I heard him say, I don't just empathize with them. I, I don't do that. I sympathize with them. You don't want me to empathize, son. You want me to sympathize. And I was like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? See, a lot of times when we're struggling with something, we all have struggles in humanity. We, we know innately, even though sometimes we've been burnt by people, that we got to get around other people who have been tempted similarly, right? So that's why we have people get to groups and they talk about their problems and they share their issues. In fact, one of the notions that's very common for people in the church is we don't want to listen to somebody who hasn't gone through what we've gone through. I think sometimes identification, this is what that's called, is overrated. What I mean by that is we put our confidence in talking to somebody about somebody about something they went through, but they didn't overcome it. That's empathy. Jesus sympathizes with us in our weakness. He went up right to the line, felt the pain of it, but he never crossed it. So when you're, when you're, this is what Jesus is like, you're having trouble praying, you, you made a commitment, you're going to pray for 21 days straight, and you're going to get up early, and the first day you got up, and you're only 10 minutes in, and you wanted to fall asleep, me too. That's what Jesus is saying, me too. But let me show you how I continued. Oh, you know what, you were, you were there, you made a commitment, you're going to eat better, and you're not going to put things in the, you know, you're not going to just pray that God changed the molecular structure of the food before it gets to your intestinal tract. Imply your faith. You're, 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 you're facing this bag of Doritos at 1130 at night. You want to eat the whole thing? Me too. But let me show you how I overcame that temptation. Is anybody tra tracking with me so far? Oh, you were on the way to church and you're in the parking lot and you want to kill somebody before you came into worship? <laughs> me too. Let me show you how I was nice to them. I had a Christian sticker on my car and that's how I got over it. Because I knew they'd see it. See, Jesus... <laughs> Jesus doesn't just, he doesn't, he sympathizes with you, but he never crossed the line. He was tempted in all points as you are, me too, but he never sinned. So there's power, not just in the identification. So he doesn't just have authority on the subject he has, of, of temptation. He has authority over temptation. Amen. Oh, man, this is so good. Man, I don't know. I don't know. You're getting what I'm saying. <laughs> so you need to ask Jesus for help because he's not going to come. Let's say you're struggling with lust. You're struggling with pride, lying. You name it. He was tempted in all of those things. Really? Yeah. All of those according to scripture. But he never crossed the line. He never sinned. So when you go to him, if you go to him, say, Jesus, I'm struggling with this. Can you help me? Yeah, me too. I understand that. I've been there. Then you got to say, God, can you help me? Jesus, can you help me overcome? Yes, I can. How many times are you going to Jesus and asking him to identify? Then you stop there and you don't ask him to help you overcome it. That's what he's there for. Oh, praise the Lord. Check out this next text. This is Deuteronomy 8.16. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you. In other words, get your heart right. That he might test you to build your character. Why? To do you good in the end. If you are facing a trial, it is for one reason. Uh, if God leads you into that trial, it's to do you good. You need to understand it's to do you good. And a lot of times we get mad at God because the scriptures are not congruent. And that doesn't match that. And why did this happen to me? It's because you misunderstand. It's because you, you're misinformed. It's, I'm going to be strong with you, but it's ignorance, really. It's really, we just don't understand these things. God doesn't tempt. He, he will test us. But whatever he leads us into, it is for your good. Romans 8.28 says, he works it all together for good to them that love him. And so, so sometimes... We, 
People sometimes say this to me, okay? And this is unqualified, so I'm going to just speed through it so hopefully it doesn't come out as arrogant. Sometimes people say, PD, you make complicated things simple. You put the cookies on the bottom shelf. And, and it's because I'm not complicated. And so God makes it simple for me because I'm simple. And then I just make it simple for you, okay? So sometimes people say to me, you know, even my kids can understand. Like sometimes I want them to be up in pictures because even, even they can understand. It's because I think like a kid, like we're on the same level. <laughs> okay? Okay? So that's why. All right. So thus you think otherwise. But let me give you a really simple principle about some of the things that cause you problems when you're reading the Bible, like Matthew 6.13 and other things like that that get us all tied up in knots, okay? So if you're trying to interpret Scripture, you're trying to understand something, but you don't understand it. Are you guys ready for this? This is a big principle. It's really profound, okay? You might want to write this down. If, you, if there's something in the Bible you don't understand, you don't understand it because you don't understand Drop the mic. It's because you don't understand. It's not the Bible. It's you. That's why the Bible tells us we have to, Romans 12, 1 through 2, we have to renew our mind. We, we have to not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Pull away from that. Plug into this. Then you will know. Ding, 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 ding. What you need to know. Revelation knowledge. What God's good Oh, he's a good God. He would never do something bad. He's not tempting me. Pleasing. Oh, this is how you live to serve him. Good, pleasing, and perfect will. Oh, that's the purpose of God for my life. That's what the word is there for us. If you don't understand it, it's because you don't understand. But you'll understand more when you're in relationship with him, which is what we'll talk about next week. But that's why you got to read your Bible. We hopefully, how many got the text about our one-year Bible? Raise your hand if you got our text. If you didn't, you're just not on our text messaging, or you never look at your phone and... Whatever. Um, but, but we want to help people go on a spiritual journey. So definitely get into your Bible. Number three. Everybody say number three. God will deliver us. God will deliver us. He'll deliver us from temptation if we will allow him. This is a great complimentary text to James chapter 1 on temptation. It's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man in other words, whatever you've gone through, somebody else has gone through that. Watch what he does, but God is faithful. So when you face a trial, a test, because temptation means the same thing, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you are able to handle. Here's the second promise of the verse. But when you face that trial, but with this temptation, this trial, this test, he will also make the way of escape so that you may be able to bear up under it. So there's two huge promises in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There's no trial test that you're facing that you're not able to face. Well, I don't feel like that. It doesn't matter. It's because you're doing some things wrong. You're facing temptations that you are able to overcome. And as soon as you start believing that, you'll start seeing yourself come over those things. The second thing is, every time you are facing a temptation, this is telling you God's going to make a way out, a way of escape for you. So, so Jesus knows that when you're tempted, you're gonna, you're gonna, the tempter's gonna, the tempter's gonna be there, and he's gonna try to pull you away. That's why he wants you to pray. I was thinking about the MC Hammer song, but I was gonna bust it out. You know, that's why we pray, pray. We gotta pray just to make it today. But I won't do that, even though I'm really tempted to do that. But anyway, no, 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 no. Because then it gets, you know, got dance moves, and, and I, I just don't want to cause anybody to stumble. Um, <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> but protection begins when we pray every single day to overcome the evil one. That's when, that's when it happens. Protection begins. We need to realize God's not tempting me. He may lead me into certain tests. He will deliver me in those tests if I, well, the last point is pray, if I pray. If you don't pray, you're going to be in trouble, Christians. I'm just telling you. The devil wants to eat you alive. The Bible says this. It says he wants to sift you as wheat. Ugh. Like he's not messing around. He plays for keeps. He's not playing funsies. You know what I'm saying? So, so but if, you, if you'll pray, he will deliver you. Listen, he'll go out of his way to try to deliver you. I, I've known this to be true in my own life. Sometimes I'm struggling with something. I'll get up. I'll read my Bible, which is just, that's your part. If you do your part, God will do his part. I read my Bible, and all of a sudden I look at the scripture I'm reading, and one verse pops out of me. I'm like, whoo, that's strong. Next, and I move on. Does anybody do that? 
That's God trying to talk to you. He's trying to give you a promise to stand on to overcome. But then I move on. Oh, I don't want to listen to that. Then I go on to the kitchen. I talk to my wife. My wife says something to me, and it's just like, that sounded just like what I just read over there. Why is that? Because God's trying to deliver me. But I, oh, turn that off. Then I go out, I get my car, I drive away, and I'm in my car. And all of a sudden, all these circumstances are opposing me. I almost get in an accident or something happens. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. God's trying to wake me up. Right? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? He will go out of his way. But some, if he will deliver you if you will let him deliver you. But you have to be praying and seeking God. I know people that, this is crazy, this is true, but I know people that have been in very difficult situations. They've been tempted to do evil right in the moment, and God goes out of his way to deliver them. How so, Pastor? They were in, let's say, inappropriate environments that could lead to very, some very inappropriate decisions, and their phone butt-dialed the pastor. <laughs> Seven to me twice. I pick up my phone, hello, hello, and I can hear the encounter. How many know that it's God trying to deliver somebody? You know what I'm saying? As soon as that phone hung up, you get your butt home right now. Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> He'll do his part if we'll do our part. Can I have an amen? Amen. So he will lead us. He will deliver us. Psalm 119 says, direct my steps by your word. Lead me. And let no iniquity, continuous sin, have dominion over me. Deliver me. This lead and this deliver is what God is trying to do. And then he goes on to say to his disciples, Matthew 26, 41, keep Watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. And we all remember this last part because we've heard it many times before. But it says, for the spirit is willing, but the body is what? Weak. See, I'm amazed how often I remember the first part, but I'm not living, the second part, but I'm not living the first part. I remember the, you know, the spirit's willing. I'm willing, but I'm so weak. God's saying, watch and pray. Lead me. And deliver me, God. That's what he's trying to do in our lives. You overcome temptation when you pray. John 17, Jesus prayed this prayer. This was, there's very few, there's prayers in the Bible, but this is one that Jesus prayed himself. John 17, 15, Jesus said, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world. Jesus' prayer for you and Jesus' prayer for me is don't take them out of the world and all the trials and testings and difficulties. I don't want that for them because they won't grow up. They won't grow up to, to do what I've called them to do. They won't receive the crown of life. They won't re- they, if they don't endure this testing, they won't receive the rewards that I have for them. I'm not praying that, Lord, but this is what I am praying. But I am praying that you protect them from the evil one. Amen. This is the exact thing that we should be saying, Lord, protect me from the evil one. The Bible says in Psalms, many are the afflictions of the righteous. That's not going to stop. But the Lord delivers them out of them all. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand on your feet let me pray for you. Did you get something out of that? I hope so. I hope you dig into it. Read James 1 this week in your devotions. As you're doing your one-year Bible, as you go forward this year, God's going to change you from his word and by his word, especially as you live it. If you need prayer in the area of temptation, this would be a good day to come. And just let's make a commitment to overcome some of these obstacles, these chronicities, these patterns of sin, these iniquities that keep holding us back. Let's break those things in our life by praying protection and asking the Lord to deliver you from all those things in Jesus' name. Amen? I was praying uh, one time and, and I just, you know, just just saying, God, I want to be a, a prayer warrior for you. I struggle sometimes in that area. And this whole last year, God has been urging me to pray. And, and I just want to say as a pastor, my heart is that we would be a praying church. Like we learn about it, yes, but we live it and we do it. We realize, you know what, we are in, we are in difficult times. The Bible says, redeem the times for the days are evil, and the coming of the Lord draweth near. I think it's a time like no other time to begin to pray and seek God. And if we do, we can return to our life, just like Jesus did, in the power of the Spirit. Amen? Overcoming and living life at a higher order of being, you know, living life abundantly the way he intended for us. But we've got to pray in order for that to happen, protection. So I want to pray for you. Would you just close your eyes and let me pray for you. And then I'm going to pray for certain people in this room that need to connect with God. But if you're here today and you've struggled with areas of temptation in your life, you know that. I want you to just look at your heart right now. The Bible says, search me and see if there will be anything It's getting in the way. Anything offensive to you, God. He's not one to judge you. 
He's wanting to deal with it. He's wanting you to be free from that. Whatever that thing is that where you, you didn't get up to the line, you crossed that line. You know, you know those areas. They're, they're probably, as a Christ follower, they're probably on your mind a lot. But whatever that is, if you want to be free from that, would you just raise your hand and say, I just want to be free. I, don't, I want to overcome in these areas. It could be anger, pride, lust, lying, all kinds of things, selfishness, gluttony, all those things. Father, in Jesus' name, every person that just wants to be set free, God, I just pray that the truths of your word would be real and evident to them today, Lord, as they go forward, that they see that Jesus sympathizes with them. Me too. I know what that's like, son. I know what that's like, daughter. I know what that's like, young man, young woman. I want to help you with that because I overcame that. I never gave into that, and I can show you how. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen their relationship with you, that they would pray, God, and seek your face, and that you would deliver them. And you will. If we pray, you will deliver us. I thank you for that. And God, for every person that's here today that maybe hasn't fully surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, you're here and yeah, it just there's a whole bunch new, but something's happened on the inside of you. Something's knocking on your heart. That's the Holy Spirit. And he's wanting, he's wanting to connect you to God. He's wanting that relationship to be established. And that happens by submitting yourself to God. The Bible says in James 4, 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But it requires surrender. It requires surrender. And when you do, you can draw near to him, and he'll draw near to you. Verse 8 says that. If you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, and you want to, you don't have to go to church to do that. But you, you have to just make with the confession of your mouth and the belief in your heart that Jesus did what he did on Calvary 2,000 years ago for you. So you could be in relationship with God the Father. If you believe that, you can, you can, you can have a relationship with him starting right now. If that's you, I want you to just, without shame, I'm not going to call you down front. I'm just going to pray for you right where you are. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand good and high and say, that's me. Pray for me. I want to come into that relation. God bless you. Yes, yes, yes. Is there anybody else? Good and high. I don't want to miss it. Thank you, son. Thank you all the way at the back there. That's awesome, sir. I see that hand. Anybody else? Even if you're listening online, you respond. There's no distance in prayer. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you for your courage. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that. That's awesome. Church, would you just pray this prayer with me? Those that raise your hand, would you pray with me? Say, Jesus. Save me right now. I invite you into my life. Deliver me. I submit to you. I thank you, God, that you gave your life for me. Now I give my life back to you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand clap all over. Come on, let's give him a good one. Happy New Year, Lord. Thank you. This is your year. This is your year.